The following podcast reflects the views and opinions of the hosts and guests only. They do not reflect the views or opinions of any agency or specific members of an association. At times, colorful language may be used and may be unsuitable for people under the age of 18. Discretion is advised. Happy New Year, everybody. Steve Grammis, president of the PPA. Uh, We're back. It's 2023. It's been a little bit since we had uh, a podcast going, but we're going to make it a point this year to really stay on top of these, push out some more some more content as well as our Instagram, our Facebook. If you're not following us, uh, LVPPA on Instagram, Facebook's the same. Uh, we uh, we will push out a lot of content. So very happy to be in 2023. Uh, with me as always is my man Dan. Dan Coyne. I'm the CFO of the PPA. Yeah, prospective. <laughs> um, doing budget right now. So Wildlife commissioner, is that what it is? Yep, yep. Just um, waiting for the call. Hoping uh, governor-elect, uh, or now just governor, uh, Lombardo, <clears throat> Uh, puts him in that position. He's going to do him jointly. Just kidding. We don't know what he's going to do. Um, but also, to my right, to your left, just got the camera on her. Uh, Adela Solano. Adela is the uh, the backbone of this uh, podcast. She is the creator. She's the content distributor. She also has a soundboard now with uh, some some fun sounds. Uh, I asked. Yeah, there, there you go. Um, it's a little weak. I, I think we could do a little better. She she told me it's the free app, mm-hmm. so it's all the free content that you're going to get. And uh, um, Adela really has done a great job keeping our podcast going. She keeps us uh, keeps us relevant. Does a great job as my assistant, as one of our office workers, and uh, everything we do kind of runs through her with events and that. So uh, we appreciate Adela being on. She's going to be on from now on. She's like Robin from uh, <laughs> Howard Stern. Uh, but we're gonna get her to talk a little bit too. We, we've got. She just said no, but she's she's gonna talk. She's gonna. She's been recognized out in the general population by people. Hey, you're Adela from the PPA. So now we got to get her out to our our audience of the 2.4 million um, that we that we touch uh, with every podcast. Excuse me. Oh, I had a little sneeze. That's live TV right there for you. When someone actually has a sneeze or maybe even you. you know break you some wind. Sound bite for that? No, I don't. You don't have a, a sneeze. No. Do the closest thing to the sneeze. Closest thing to sneeze. Uh, I heard it earlier. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, there okay, go. there it is. It's the closest thing we have to a sneeze. So um, uh, we, we got a pretty good show today. Um, we're going to have, a, hopefully, a pretty in-depth conversation with uh, new uh, undersheriff Andy Walsh. I've known Andy uh, pretty much our entire careers. We've been on the department the same amount of time, hired on 98, and a uh, solid guy. I think it's a great choice from... Uh, uh, Sheriff McMahill to make him his number two, mm-hmm. and uh, we're, we have really high hopes for the new administration. Not that we dislike the last administration, because I, I did get to know and really got to like uh, Joe uh, and his cabinet. Chris Darcy was a really good guy. Laz Chavez, solid guy. Um, just just good people all around. Uh, but I think we're going to see a change with what we're yeah. walking into with Kevin and his team. Well, I mean, just uh, just openly, they've said they're going to work on morale. They're going to work on employee wellness. Um, you know that that he ran because he he cares about and wants to make a difference with the line um, patrol and corrections officers. So I, it, that's what he's saying, and you know, I think he's going to be true to that, and it's going to be it's going to be great if he is. Some of the things we're going to talk to Andy about are uh, the the delegate position, beards, uh, mm-hmm. uniforms. Uh, some issues at the jail. Yep, with uh, mandated overtime. Yeah, you know we we're uh, we're gonna front load him with some stuff that you know maybe he'll have an answer for some things. Maybe he has to kind of go back and do some research, and that's okay. Um, but uh, the one thing that our folks need to know is is you should not be afraid to talk to this new administration. If you see under Sheriff Walsh out and about, say hello, engage him. He wants to be engaged. Sheriff McMahill, engage him. They don't want you to be quiet and don't air your complaints to him. They want to know. Um, don't be an ass. But, you know, you can tell them, hey, things over here in DTAC just aren't working the way we're doing X, Y, and Z. So I think it's important that uh, they are engaging, just like us at the PPA, that we're engaging. And uh, you go out there and you take the advantage of that because, you know, in four years you may not have that. If Kevin steps down and someone else takes over that has a different mantra, mm-hmm. you don't know where that's going to go. So for at least four years you got to take advantage of it. Yep, yep. I think it's going to be a good change. Um, you know, when the guys are, are approachable and, you know, they're hearing the problems right right from the line. A lot of times, you know, the more people you tell, he kind of loses credibility on, on the way up. So uh, that'll, that'll be good. 
Love it. All right. So uh, I think uh, Under Sheriff Walsh is here. I think we did. We give him his goodie bag already, Adela. Yes, we did. R a Rolex, a uh, wad of cash. Yep. And uh, keys to a, a Lexus that he can use. It's only a lease. We couldn't afford the purchase, but um, you know. So I thought it was a Ford Ranger. Well, it's it's got a it's a Ford Ranger with a Lexus kit. Okay. <laughs> so it's got the emblem on the front end, and uh, got to get donated by Goodyear. Yeah, good. Yeah, Goodyear <laughs> kicks out a quality product. Ask uh, John Abel if you see him how how well his '93 Ranger rental yeah. went. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we're gonna come back. We're gonna talk with Andy. Spend a lot of time with him talking about some stuff. And uh, then we'll talk about a few more topics and we'll close up today. So stay tuned. All right. Uh, first guest is uh, Under Sheriff Andy Walsh, uh, formerly Assistant Sheriff, Chief, Captain at Downtown, Mr. Cigar himself yes. uh, <laughs> at Downtown. Um, we appreciate you coming on the show. We know it's your first week in the office officially with uh, new sheriff. And so we appreciate you making time coming on the show. No, I appreciate the invite, Dan. Steve, thanks for having me. No worries. Um, so just want to talk about... Uh, little bit of stuff that people are asking us about uh, how quick we could expect certain things and um, a couple of the topics really revolve around appearance so beards you know during Kevin's campaign trail he said listen I got no problem with beards uh, for everybody if you want to wear one just keep it neatly trimmed in that and then the uniform so can you I know it's only a few days in but if you can provide an update yeah. uh, on timing policy how it changes how quick it can change things like that um, and then kind of give everybody a little bit of perspective yeah, so Kevin uh, is giving direction for that policy to change uh, immediately. So they have to write it, but it'll be reflective of what you just said, that it, that uh, campaign promise of uh, beards allowed, neatly trimmed. Uh, and an interesting tidbit was when we were out walking on uh, New Year's Eve, this officer, I can't remember his name, but he came up to us and he said, hey, no one would, no, everybody said I wouldn't have the courage to ask you this question. So I'm going to ask anyway. He said, when are, when are we going to be allowed to have beers? And Kevin said, right away. He said, we just have to change the policy and get that through review and do all that. But So it's coming um, uh, very quickly. So uh, neatly trimmed is going to be, obviously, uh, I saw some uh, haircuts and things on New Year's Eve that were kind of funny, but uh, walking around. But no, he's true uh, to his word. That's coming very quickly. Uh, he's not a patient man, so I would expect that that's going to happen here in the next couple of weeks. Uniforms, though, uh, we looked at a different uh, pair of pants yesterday. The challenge we're having, the pants will change. I don't think the shirt's going to change, but uh, the, the uh, couple things with uniforms. One is the, the color of the shirt to try to get tan pants in that uh, typical style that people like, that uh, cargo pocket type pant that uh, is out there. It's really com I looked at a pair yesterday, it just looked really comfortable. Like if you were in patrol, you'd want to be wearing these, uh, but the color is just doesn't match the tan shirt. So we looked at a, a green one. Uh, it looks strikingly similar to other organizations. Some not really, I don't particularly like that look, but um, we'll see. I think the pant is the right pant, but uh, getting in the right color is going to be the next phase of this challenge and then having it go out to bid. So it's coming. That's just going to take a little longer than changing the policy to get the right pant. but. If we can get the ones that I looked at yesterday that we had a sample of in the right color, I think those are the ones that our workforce is going to be really pleased to be wearing. So, um, the the shirt you said the shirt won't change. You yeah. Mean so this tan uniform color, shirt, right? The design or the feel should change. It's going. Is it still going to be machine washable? Is that because yeah. that's what was said to people like, hey, yeah. we're, you're going to be able to take your whole uniform if you want, throw it in the washing machine, you can take care of it that way. Um, the PPA had some people come up here with some different shirts, uh, vendors, and said, you know, hey, check these out. And some of them were, you know, 40, 50 percent lighter, uh, better material, a little bit more stretch to them, still look like a uniform shirt. Uh, but those are things that, you know, not just the bottoms. Of course, the bottoms are important. That wool pant is archaic and uh, it's not functional. But the shirt, too, is doesn't have a really good breathability factor uh, for a patrol officer to wear. Yeah, and I've seen, I haven't seen uh, anything other than this, but it, it could be just because I'm behind the curve on the shirt, more focused on the pants, but I can find out about the shirts. But if that was something that he's put out there that is going to change as well, then you know, I promise you that if he's campaigned on that, then that's going to happen. Yeah, I, I just, I know that, uh, and you've worn it, the uniform, you know, you, you've uh, been out there, you're still wearing it today. It's, it's just uh, to be out there in 110 degree yeah. heat. It's not uh, that's not the best thing for our folks to wear uh, uh, you, out there working. Soaking wet, wool pants, yeah. just it's it's not conducive to 
good health. <laughs> and, uh, speaking of good health and the uniforms, um, a lot of our guys have been asking about the load bearing vests. I know it wasn't a, a popular um, uh, subject with Kevin in the past, but I heard he was going to start looking into it. Is there any any talk on that? Nothing yet. Okay. Um, I don't even think that we've had uh, any samples of those provided other than what we, I've seen in pictures. People have brought to me, uh, I spent some time in Chicago a few years ago and had a lot of conversations with the officers there that were wearing them. Uh, seem to like it, you know. Uh, uh, challenge I have with some of the ones that I've seen is the uh, amount of equipment that people start to put in, put into it. It kind of looks, I don't know, it looks a little bulky. It doesn't, but if it's getting stuff off their waist, and you know, I, I'm fortunate as long as I've worn a gun belt and a vest and those things, I've never had any of those health issues that come with it. But I know a lot of people that have, and directly attributed to. You know the gun belt and yep. that's why they have the wider one they wear to support their back and everybody's body's constructed different i'm just fortunate uh, that it hasn't happened to me but i know that people do suffer it so it's something that we can definitely bring to the table um, it's just really about their health and well-being that's most important okay great outside of uniforms uh, what kind of things should we expect should our cops should our citizens because we have a lot i mean adela what are we up to now 2.8 million followers on the podcast um, and we haven't done it in a while, but yeah, we're closing in on 3 million. Um, and so we have people in India, Florida, Europe, I mean, all over the place that listen to this thing. And so not just for our cops, but for the citizens too of Las Vegas, if they're coming here to visit or they are here, what kind of things should we all expect from the police department, from the vision Joe had to the vision you and Kevin have? Yeah. So you know, one of the things, no matter who the sheriff is, you know, we are a police department. So, you know, focusing on crime is always going to be a priority for us and the quality of life in our community. You know, we all live here. Uh, so we all want, you know, our families and friends and people uh, that we know and care about in this community to be safe as they go about their everyday endeavors, you know. Um, and when we, we focus on crime and making sure that everybody is safe when they're out there, uh, that's a priority for us, but how do we get there is, you know, one of the things that we're going to focus on as an organization, and Kevin campaigned on this, the sheriff campaigned on this, was, you know, a wellness bureau, making sure that our cops are taken care of and that they know they're supported at work and when they need support outside of work that, you know, we have people and functions in place to take care of them and their families. Uh, you know, we just did a CSA graduation this morning and you know we know what those young people will see over the course of the first couple of years of their career and you know I always said that no one should have to see the world through a cop's eyes and over time I've expanded that thought that you know what the dispatchers and the call takers listen to and what our crime scene analysts and people out there in the field besides the commission folks what our corrections officers see and experience you know there's a, a you know, sheriff has talked used the word humanity several times this week and um, that's an important thing to realize uh, that there's a, you know, a humanity piece of this, that uh, job that not only do we have to see that in the community and the people we serve, but in my position, we have to make sure that everybody on our executive staff and command staff re are reminded of that, that there's, you know, treat the folks that work for us with that same humanity in mind and the cops that are out there and the call takers and all the people that I've mentioned that it's a, a tough job. And I think the world is going to see this police organization with your help and with the help of people in the community that are going to step up to make sure that our wellness program that we create uh, is going to be second to none and we're going to be the best cared for uh, police organization in the world and it doesn't even have to be just us but the other first responders you know people in the fire services and medical response services in, the, in our community are reaching out and talking to us about you know how can they be a part of it so I think that's the biggest thing that people are going to see is obviously the focus on crime, but uh, we're going to get there by making sure that our people are well taken care of. What do you What do you guys have planned for hiring? So you know, one of the big things is is that we just can't get applicants. I don't know what the change was back when you and I hired on. You had three to four thousand people putting an application for fifty spots in an academy, right. and now we're I mean the May of May of nineteen. We had, I think it was 1,500 applicants put in. May of 21, we had 284. Yeah, our applications went down. We know, you know, 2020 uh, and all the things associated with George Floyd and, you know, that uh, some of the hiring is attributing, 
you know, is attributed to that and the challenges that police departments face. We're fortunate. I think the last number I got about a week ago was we have about a 5% vacancy factor, which I think every police department around the country would trade places with us, but we still have work to do, especially in that area I referred to earlier with dispatch and communications, you know, uh, the number of vacancies we have there and the amount of work that we're asking the men and women that work in that facility to do in the mandated overtime, uh, you know, we're hemorrhaging there and it's affecting the people that work there. It's affecting their quality of life outside of work. You know, we have to fix that. We have to attract people to this organization uh, in ways that we've never been challenged to do. You know, it used to be we could open the door and say we're testing, like you said, and we just, we would have too many people show up for a testing. Um, but it's not that way. And, and, you know, understanding what that, challenges uh, and why it's occurred it's not just us it's you know other professions and you know you can't go a, a day or two without seeing a news story about a business that can't hire people or um, you know and the, and the technology I think in some cases works against us there's a lot of jobs and careers out there where people don't have to leave their home anymore and you know we're never going to be that kind of a place uh, so I think when people are choosing careers you know we have to look at what it is about working here, no matter where you work, uh, whether it's a police officer, corrections, professional sports staff, whatever it is, um, we have to figure out what it is that's most attractive uh, about those things and then advertise and sell those things and then touch those audiences uh, often and frequently. Uh, and it, sometimes it's the personal visits to places that uh, the personal conversations you can have with people. Um, you know, I get stopped a lot when I'm in uniform. People ask me if I like my job or, you know, and of course i do the best i can to sell it and we have to keep that o mind open too it's not just about the police officer positions which are vital but we can sell we just like i said the graduation we had this morning you know i mean a group of smart people i spoke to one of them and, you know she's got a biology degree you know like we're, we we have the ability to attract people to the jobs we have um we just have to keep pounding away at it and just let it be something that's in our everyday conversations it has to be the first and second things we talk about all the time my niece graduated this morning in that academy. Yeah, it was a great yeah. group of people. And, you know, you could see the look on their faces. They're excited, you know. Uh, and we have to be there. I know it's a, it's a long stretch. I think they said it's 33 and a half years or something before they can, oh, Stop it. You know, no, it's for the new sheriff. Yeah. Yeah. No. It, 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 you, you got, oh, God. Every time someone says that, it's like nails on a chalkboard. It's not no. accurate. It's not 33 and a half years. years. That's what they say, and that's why I asked no, this. Is that, that's not, know, who says it? Uh, the the director yeah. over CSA, yeah. I, I know how to deal with her. Uh, no, it's, she wasn't there. It was yeah. somebody else. But uh, no, it, but it's, when you look at it, though, even if it's 25 years, right? I, I think even for me, when I hired on, you know, a long time ago in another city, um, I never really thought about that, right? And that's just one of the things that we have to shift is it's not how I looked at it when I hired on. How is the workforce that's available out there for us to tap into to try to bring into working at this place uh, that we call Metro, you know, wh how are they viewing it? And like you said, if they're being provided inaccurate information, then that that's one of the nuances that we obviously need to fix. But, but the other thing too is like, look at between New York and here, I've been doing this over 30 years and it feels like it flies by, but telling that to somebody that's just about to enter field training, you know, it, it's, it, it's a little different for them, but I don't know that they look at it that way. Cause I know we didn't, I didn't look at it like, Oh my God, I gotta do this for the next 30 years. I was, I just couldn't wait to go do it and do it for as long as, you know, the job or the good Lord would allow me to do it, you know? So whether it was, I could retire in 10, 20, here it is 30 years later, I'm still rolling out of bed and coming to work. So, well, um, to, to put it on record, our police officers, all they have to do is five years. So they'll get a pension. Um, so the new contracts five and 65, um, 10 and 60 and 20 and 50. So they do 20 years, they, they get an unreduced pension at 50. But we'd like to keep them well into the 30, 33 sure. year mark. Um, but currently under the current structure of PERS, there's really no financial incentive for them to stay. And um, there's things that you know could be a financial incentive like the drop program. And we had a, a team of financial gurus and analysts put a, put a bill together for that. But I know in dispatch right now, you guys have enacted the critical staffing um, uh, law where you can hire back dispatchers or when they retire, they can keep working. And under that law, I believe is as long as it's um, one position is on staffed, which I think we have 300 on staffed police officers right now, 
you can enact that. Um, is that something you'd be willing to do or you guys have looked at? Um, we haven't looked at it. I'd have officers? to really take a good look at that before. Uh, I'd rather work on fixing, you know, and getting people into the academies and keeping people, uh, you know, interested in coming to join us. I, I think there's a lot to think about when you bring people out of retirement to do a dangerous job like we're, we have. But there's maybe some opportunities and, mm -hmm. you know, we do have still some uh, <clears throat> cold case folks that came out of retirement and worked the 19 hours. I mean, there's some opportunities, but I don't, we've we've tried a variety of things over the years. We remember we, 10, 15 years ago, we had a reserve option or program out there and, you know, what it would take for them to go through the training and all that. Not a lot of people are willing to do that. Like you said, there's the incentive to come back and um, sometimes isn't always there. And then I think too, there's always the questions too. There's some stuff out there today about qualified immunity and, you know, would they really want to come back if that's even a question uh, for them? So I don't know. I think I think we're better served. Uh, there's a lot of experience that's out there. Uh, trust me, there are a few have called me and told me how to do my job already. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I think that there's a tremendous value in some of the folks that are out there in retirement that might want to come back. I think we just have to find the right places for them. I don't know if it's fair to expect them to go back out into patrol and say, here you go. Well, and, I, I, and I think, I think so what Dan's talking about, like with the drop program, if you're, if you're not totally schooled up on it and, and that's okay. Cause we don't have it here. Um, but it's basically, and it would affect you uh, as the undersheriff, you've got almost 25 years. It'd be 25 years in July. Yeah. Uh, you could say, Hey, I'm entering drop now. I'm not vacating my position. I'm staying here. I'm not going anywhere. But what happens is, is you continue to draw your salary and your pension money no longer climbs. But what happens is, is they start putting that in a separate account for you right away. So then when you say, okay, hey, I have to be in drop for, I think it's three, three years. Minimum is how it's written right so now. So you can't leave and get that drop money unless you do the three years. So now what we've did is we've taken you at 25 and we've almost guaranteed to keep you to 28 as we continue to hire behind that. And so um, the only thing really that doesn't get affected is, and this doesn't affect you guys because your position, but call out. Um, anybody that would get call back and the pensionable money, that no longer happens. You don't, I, okay, I can't- for that time period. I can't increase my PERS. For all intents and purposes, I am retired when PERS considers me. So I'm building that pot of money. Now I still get raises, like every three years I'll get my COLA in retirement. Okay. Then when I leave, they go, here is $340,000 plus you were making your paycheck there so the the advantage is is that you guys the agency keeps an officer without them trying to jump ship as quick as they can um, and it doesn't really affect you you still make a PERS payment like you would for our normal roll-ups just no callback and that's it and so it gives you that buffer of time to to keep me here keep me in homicide keep me in robbery whatever it is and you don't necessarily have to ship me back to patrol and we're not bringing anyone back from where they were so it's a it's a it's a great retention tool. Yeah. Um, great financial tool for the employees. Um, it's just something that we have to get passed by the legislator right now. Um, but if that doesn't happen, pretty much the employer has the ability at any time to create that program on their own in a different facet through the critical staffing. Yeah, I think we'd have to, obviously, the people that are the financial geniuses would have for to sure. tell me the impact of that. And the only other thing just on the uh, other side of that is if we have, I, I agree that retaining talent and getting people to stay here for that long is, you know, especially in some key critical areas, you know, you can't just teach somebody how to do a homicide investigation. It takes a lot of time. So guys like Cliff Mogg, who've decided to stick around and some, some of the folks, Dan Long coming back and doing cold cases, you know, those guys are really important to the development of those folks. Um, and I'm sure there's other key people in other key areas. Um, but the other side of that is that how does it affect people's ability to promote over time. I guess that position gets frozen. I'd have to look at that too, because that would be one of the side effects of it too. I think if you had sergeants that were in that program for a couple of years, then if they weren't going to retire and stay, yes, we do keep that experience, but at the same time, it slows down the promotions. But there's probably some, there's probably a lot of nuances to it beyond the financial aspect of it, whether or not it's even affordable, I don't know. Well, the, I, I think too, the hope is, is that it brings us closer to that 2.0 per thousand. You know, right. I mean, if, if we continue to, I don't know if you know these numbers, I don't, um, but are we still outpacing new hires on the PO side with what we lose in retirement or separation? Yeah, so Rich Bre Hogan briefed us the other day that the 
uh, separations this year in December were far less than they were last year. I don't have the exact number. I didn't bring a lot of math with me, but um, that's a good sign, you know, that we were able to, we didn't see the amount of retirees this year. So, you know, who's eligible? There's a lot that factors into that, but what Rich usually projects is pretty accurate. And to have that number come in below where he thought, so we were able to keep some folks. Um, but still, that you know, that's just minimum staffing number in patrol, for example, is something we're going to have to take a good hard look at because, and then the philosophy behind it, you know, minimum staffing is not a goal. You know, like sure. if the minimum staffing number is, you know, 1,200 or whatever it is now for patrol uh, valley-wide, then the goal isn't to get to 1,200. The goal is to be well above that minimum staffing number. And uh, so we have to take a good look at that and see, you know, patrol is the, you know, uh, we say this and, you know, we know what patrol uh, means to this community uh, and keeping that those substations full and those substations packed with cops is the key to, you know, reducing violent crime, in my opinion, you know, responding to it and investigating it. We have some people that do fantastic work in those areas when we can't prevent it, but we're, we're going to have trouble with prevention if we don't have police officers out there engaged in the community. And I'm not just talking about being proactive and car stops and person stops, just being visible. Sure. You know, just people knowing that there's an officer there. It's, it's always intrigued me, this concept of a ghost car. You mean, you know, and I love the analogy when, you know, oh, so we can put a police car in a parking lot and not even put a cop in it and it's going to deter crime. That's, you know, so as a thought and as a strategy, uh, it's amazing that, you know, um, we, we can, uh, think that way but you know the uniform presence in certain neighborhoods and what we actually ask those officers to do be engaged talk to the community those things that's that's how we're going to get our where we're going to achieve our biggest successes i know back when you talk about like the area command so um when doug was sheriff uh and he had the issue with the county commission about the uh, surplus fund and him talking about needing to keep money on the back end and that and they said listen we are your guarantor. You need money. We are the ones that pay it. You don't need to set aside money for that rainy day fund, if I, if I recall correctly. Um, so you and I go back to a time when, and I remember this, uh, we were both working at Northwest, when you'd get a, an AM around 10. Hey, anyone want to stay over? Graves is short till 3, 4 in the morning when things usually died down. Uh, and we've gotten away from that model because people always say, you know, I call it the T-Rex syndrome. You know, everyone has those T-Rex arms when mm. the overtime pocket's got to be reached. Uh, but it was effective because one of our concerns is always having, you know, uh, you were the chief. We even talked about it when uh, I think it was, uh, when did we go to Enterprise? It was after Ty's, Ty's shooting, yeah. right? And, uh, and you and I talked about an issue where uh, when you were the chief and I said, hey, you've still got Area Command Captain sending people to VCI when they only have four guys to begin with. And the sergeants are too spineless to say, I'm sending no one. I don't have enough to cover calls for service and be safe. And it came up again, that briefing. The guy said, no, we're still in the same boat. They're sending right. VCI, uh, holiday initiative, and we only have two or three here. And so I said, hey, it's still going on. But the way to fix that, I think, is, is to say, hey, we gotta loosen up our pockets a little and say, right. hey, you know what? How many do we got? We've got four on swings. All right, you know what, day shift. Anybody wanna stay over and make you know, four or five hours of overtime. Yeah. And I think we we were able to combat that back then because, guys, once you're already out there, it's not getting out of bed and coming in and working four hours. You're like, all right, I can do another four or five sure. here. That's no big deal. But um, and but the thing was always, well, you know, the overtime, the overtime. Well, the county says and the city say, we're the ones that will pay your bill. Well, so, I, I think what we, you know, even the most recent example was we had the you know, three officers from the same squad involved in an officer involved shooting this weekend. And now as they go through that process and, you know, recover from that incident and go through all the things that we're going to ask them to go through before they come back to work, um, you know, the, the first question we ask is, how's that station? How's that squad? You know, and what are we doing? And, you know, captains have the autonomy to manage their overtime budgets. And so they are entrusted with that. You know, they may not like the questions sometimes. Hey, why are you at 80% of your budget or whatever? We ask those questions. We have a responsibility to ask those questions. Uh, but like you and I always say, is, is as long as you can explain what it is and why it is you're doing it, and then if you need help uh, from other places, other area commands, if we need to send you some resources to, you know, combat a shortage or deal with a crime issue, you know, you can tell the ones, the captains that actually grasp that and, no problem. You know, they'll tell you what it is they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, we just, 
you can't abuse it but at the same time you're right that's up to them that's that's never something that should come to me for permission you know that's something that we want those captains to manage and that's why you know we always talk about captains in our agency being the equivalent of the chief of police in some other cities and when you look around our country you know they actually have our captains actually have a larger budget have more area to cover uh, are more engaged with elected officials uh, then some chiefs of police in other cities because of just the size and the volume and the complexity of what they deal with. So they should act accordingly, you know. So hopefully they're watching this and they hear it from me. Uh, don't, we want you not to go over your budget, but we give you a budget for that reason. Uh, you have to manage it. You're going to be the one held accountable uh, for the crime and the wellness and the well-being of your people in that area command. So, you know, use it as you see fit. And, uh, you know, I, I, no one's ever gotten in trouble for... Uh, spending eighty percent of their overtime budget, bec and at the same time took good care of their people, and m had an impact on crime, had an impact on the quality of life in the community. That's what it's there for. That's what we go to the city and the county for. You know, not it's not a it's not a savings account. It's it's not meant to be spent recklessly either. It just takes a little bit of leadership and a little bit of responsibility to do exactly what you're saying, and they have the freedom and the authority to do that. It, it, I think some people think they're going to get some award by not spending. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you no, know, I've never gotten an award for coming in under budget. I, right. Well, know, and let, I didn't get fired let, for being over budget. Let, so. Let's, I mean, really, you talk about the, the budgeting aspect of it. Yeah. And you say, hey, Andy, what did you spend this year? Listen, I only spent 50000 in overtime. Typically, next year's response is, we're only going to give you about 50000 Well, and here's another thing, too, is we talk about, you know, the sergeants, uh, you know, uh, we looked at the, it was brought to our attention about the span of control of sergeants. And so, you know, we budgeted this year for an overtime position for a sergeant uh, to be a floater at, that's used at the discretion of the watch commander so that when there is a shortage at an area command, somebody calls in sick, somebody can't come to work, somebody's on vacation, whatever the reason is that they have leave, um, you have that sergeant that's being paid overtime that can, if that supervisor, I think the number is 18, if there's more than 18 or 60, whatever the number is, then the watch commander can s take that overtime sergeant every shift and put him in, in position. So we, we're spending the money as an organization. The captains uh, you know, uh, know that they have the ability to do that. And I'm really glad that we're touching on this and, and that you said that about the captains watching because every year we do a briefing, um, every single briefing we hit uh, double squad nights and pretty much throughout every area command, the sergeants were saying, we, our guys can't get lunch because we're so short staffed. I'm telling them they can't take any lunch and I'm, and they're reaching out to their captains about it and they're not, they're not doing the overtime and they're not helping them out with bodies. So it's really good for them to hear that use that overtime for those situations. Cause number one thing about wellness is, Hey, let's, let's take care of the guys when they're not getting the lunch breaks. They don't feel taken care of. Yeah. I, I just, it's, it's, especially when it's a staffing issue, you know, and nothing pains me more to, you know, hear stories about officers going on violent calls by themselves. And, you know, and then you look at, you ask about, you know, people coming in to help them and, no, we don't. We didn't. We didn't have the permission to work overtime. It's just painful, uh, um, you know. But going back to the VCI idea too is one thing I should touch on is uh, we're going to bring back the mobile crime saturation team, which I think will alleviate that burden uh, from the area commands and feeling like they have to send people. Uh, yeah, you and I have been in a few briefings where I've said, hey, you know, all and it's interesting. It's a it's a lesson in leadership. It's a lesson in learning for me is. I ask a question and then all of a sudden it's like, you know, how it spins up. All I did was ask, hey, how come there's nobody from so-and-so over here? And, um, you know, it, it, we, leaders need to know that they have to be able to make a decision, make a sound decision, uh, stand by it. it. may not, I may not like it, but if it's their logic, then, you know, there might be a, a learning curve there for me. There might be a learning curve there for everybody, but... Um, but to alleviate that and that burden, you know, we started that program years ago with the Violent Crime Initiative to really address some of the murders and the violence that was occurring in areas that we called persistent hotspots. And, uh, you know, we, we're going to take a good look at that here in the next couple of days and figure out how we can staff a mobile crime saturation team. But it's not just as simple as putting bodies on it. You know, we can find the bodies. Uh, that's going to be the easy part. It's the equipment that goes with it, the space, the lockers, where are they housed, cars, you know, how do we do all that? Uh, so uh, I should have uh, something in the next week or two on that and how we're going to roll that out. But um, that should alleviate that. And then that's the same group of people that we know when we assemble 
groups of cops and say, hey, this is what we want you to do. We want you to go into this neighborhood and, and work on this. Uh, that we'll, we'll get a tremendous amount of success from that, um, as opposed to just invariably, okay, uh, eeny, meeny, miny, you're doing VCI tonight. You know, it, it worked, uh, it, you know, it, it's had some successes, but it's time for a change. Can you, can you go to prison for attempting to murder a dummy? You certainly can. It's funny you should bring that up because uh, a local <laughs> reporter told me she started to get mail uh, from uh, Shane Schindler was his name. Uh, he, he confessed, I guess, by mail to a, a local reporter. She sent me a text yesterday saying she's been getting mail from him so and he wants to talk to her or something. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, look, and, and that's the thing, too, I think, uh, when you talk about <laughs> being creative or, you know, uh, having some, you know, ability as a leader to do, you know, it's funny. I was a captain when that happened. And, uh, I, you know, the people that knew about it were the folks that I was working with every day, my lieutenants and the sergeants and, you know, the PD guys that whose schedule we changed to kind of do the surveillance on the thing. And, uh, you know, when that word got out, uh, I remember getting a phone call and someone said it was, uh, Charles Hank was my chief and he called me, he said, Hey, I heard you put a you, got a, you got an operation going with a mannequin out on the street. And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> you know, and it wasn't like, hey, why didn't you ask me? You know, uh, it was like, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> so, and I told him and same thing, like, you know, a little bit of a uh, uh-oh moment for me. But sure. uh, when I explained what I was doing, he said, all right, you know, and then when it worked, all of a sudden it was... Uh, Best idea ever. Best idea <laughs> ever, you know. And it's funny that that story still goes around. There's a guy writing a book about homeless murders now that I've I'm, I'm spoken to that's fascinated by that idea. And, look, that's the kind of thing that, look, wherever it comes from in my own head, that's just because of the way I've been pushed throughout my career just to be creative and think outside the box. And I know those are cliches, but, you know, especially now we have, a you know, an opportunity as an organization to do things a little differently and, you know, we have a lot of people in new positions, you know, three new assistant sheriffs, for example, and, you know, getting them to be comfortable in their role. It's not going to happen in a week, but, you know, working at our levels is something that becomes really important, you know, and uh, I'll feel bad about it being harder to get a hold of me some days for some people that, <coughs> you know, that I've grown up with on the organization. I'll still make time for people, but, you know, I have a responsibility and a role, and, and if everybody does their role, you know, we should be okay. Um, there'll be some hiccups, obviously, along the way, but you know, it, things are, things always seem to work out. We're a really good organization that develops and trains leaders, uh, and where we're constantly learning and training is the, the decision-making part and, you know, making good decisions. I always say three things to make in a decision. You know, make the right decision is the best thing. Make the wrong decision is the second best thing. No decision is paralyzing, you know, and that's what we want people to do is make those decisions. And some of them are going to be wrong. I, I told the folks the other day, I said, go out and fail. And they looked at me like I was crazy. But, you know, when people are patting you on the back for all the good things you've done and all the successes, you know, the, the, the mannequin and some of the other things that I was successful with as a captain, that as a team <clears> in DTAC, we were successful with, um, you know, those came out of, you know, uh, some severe failures. You know, people forget that I had a string of murders the year before I had about five murders six murders in over a 10-day period and uh I had a murder that occurred at the safari motel at about four o'clock in the morning on lower east Fremont street and uh as a captain I went to every murder and uh I get out to this one scene where dead guy laying in the parking lot of this motel with a bullet wound in the middle of his forehead and uh the undersheriff at the time was Kevin McMahon he beat me to the scene and he was in uniform, you know, and he was losing sleep over the crime and the murders and in my area command. And, you know, that was a, a fun conversation at 430 in the morning about what was I doing about crime. So, you know, realizing you have to be bold and daring and maybe a little crazy, you know, sometimes in your creativity and do things. It was those That success was born out of other failures. And that's what people need to do is go out, try if it doesn't work, you know. Don't give up, you know, scrap it, start over, but keep working towards success. So speaking of, of new new things, new ideas, uh, the PPA, you and I talked back when um, we created the new delegate position. And uh, the, the delegate position was born out of uh, Brian Yant and I going back east. We were invited by the NYPD to attend their uh, delegate convention. We didn't know what the heck it was. Um, so we went out there and it was, a, it was a really cool model. And so we pushed the delegate model out here, which is basically... 
as best as possible. Every shift, every area has a union delegate. That union delegate can brief people, can get information from the board of director who gets information from us. Um, a lot of people still don't really know what it is. The good thing about having you here is you came from yeah. NYPD and we talked earlier about, hey, can you kind of share the importance of what that delegate was to you, which kind of dovetails into what we're hoping they do for us here. Yeah, we, you know, <clears throat> growing up as a cop in uh, New York was, uh, you know, uh, obviously huge experience in my life. But, you know, you and get you're to, a Yankee fan. You're not a Met yeah, fan. No, nah, you know, Jan Any, Janine's Anyone the Met that's fan, a Met so. fan. Well, you can't say that. I got yeah. I have something I was going to come in on and say <laughs> anyone that's a Met fan probably doesn't even belong in New York. It's one town for one team, and it's the Yankees, and it's the Giants. So if you're a Met fan, you should just, like, go be a, uh, you know, a Braves fan. Well, so it's funny you should say that because my daughter, Emma, uh, is claiming now that she's a Braves fan. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, clearly, I'm failing as a parent. But uh, no, so, you know, the delegate position in the NYPD this was like the first person you met when you got to a station, you know. It was like, yeah, the, the, but most importantly, it was... Uh, when things were going on, you know, whether they were like contract negotiations or you got a notice that you were going to internal affairs or, you know, you had uh, anything happening, you know, you couldn't get a day off, for example, you know, you had an advocate there for you, somebody that you could turn to. It was a, typically a senior guy, a guy that had been around a long time and uh, could tell you, hey, kid, here's what's, you know, what you got to do or here's how to go about doing this. Um, and, and they were always there. You know, there was a couple at the precinct I worked in, and uh, they were great. I mean, they were just the guys that you could turn to uh, and get information from. And I think the key for the NYPD and why it's so important there is, you know, there's 77 precincts now, I believe, and just the uh, – can you imagine – I mean, we know what the rumor mill does here. Can you imagine a place, a city of 10 million people and 30,000-plus cops and 77 mm -hmm. – precincts and you know so imagine what the rumors are like there so I'll give you an example I got a uh, contacted yesterday about a rumor that's out there that you know we're going to get rid of the PD model for example which is the like I, I don't even know who would have thought of that to even start that but you know no that's not what that's not happening you know but it's apparently spreading like wildfire as a rumor so you know if there was a delegate at an area command for example I wouldn't have to and I don't mind answering the question but you know it would be something they wouldn't even have to spend five minutes worrying about it would be a call to you know or con yeah, you go ask someone so maybe they heard something about it and it, it's look it's communication it, i think that's the big thing is it's a way to get information that circles are about that becomes really important whether it's questions about qualified immunity that are currently going around whether it's questions about bill drafts whether it's questions about contract negotiations or the one thing we you know the pers increase for example what are the strategies for both the uh, collective bargaining agreements and bargaining sections as uh, units and, and the department you know what 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 does this all really mean we talked a little bit beforehand about you know how much time people actually have to work like little questions like that that i might not know the answer to but you know <coughs> uh, it's it's an information uh, conduit to people that because when they leave that briefing room, especially in the area commands, or when they go out onto the dispatch floor, or they go somewhere, right? That those, um, you know, we don't want them thinking about things that can distract them from the job at hand. And when you're, you know, it's just like distracted driving. If you look down for a quick second, you might miss something. Or you, we don't want our, I don't want officers out there, police officers, thinking, worrying about things that they can get a straight answer to. So, it, for me, it was great because we always had somebody we could turn to, and then it was always, like I said, it was always a senior, older guy that um, he told you, kid, here's what's going to happen. Here's how we're going to do this especially after a critical incident, you know, the, those were the guys they could put their arm on you. And, you know, you and I, we've all been on enough of these scenes <clears> where, you know, even the most tough as nails guys, you know, you could see the pale white looks or the, you know, eyes like this after, an, you know, some of the amazing work that they do. Um, it's, it's very stressful for them. And so to have somebody that they know they can turn to right away, I think it just adds to our success. I, you know, and I'm going to help you guys make sure everybody in every section knows that that's okay by me for you to be a delegate, you know, so I don't know why they wouldn't want to do it, uh, but uh, it should be embraced. It's just, it's a, it's just another tool for the police officers in the briefing room to get really reliable information. And, and it was, uh, it was, it was funny because uh, Pat Lynch <clears throat> spoke at the delegate convention that we went to and he said to his delegates, he said, listen, what you need to realize is 
in a briefing room, uh, you are the highest ranking union official in the building at that point. Not the e-board, we're not out there. The board of director may be there, but you are. And so to what you just said, like you wanna, you wanna instill some confidence in everybody that, hey, if I tell you we're not getting rid of PD, you believe me. I'm yeah. not conjecture, right. I'm not rumor mill, I'm the guy that talks to, uh, the other night, had a kid on uh, New Year's, I called you. He says, hey Steve, do you know about the uh, fireworks? Are they still gonna go, simple stuff. Right. And we drop a call to you. They felt reassured because they're like, listen, I know I got real time intel. Right. And I think that's what that delegate is as well. And you and I talked about like a, a signifier, a pin, something that these, especially in patrol, can wear so that when your folks are on scene, upper staff, they know, hey, there's our delegate. Like this person's here. Right. If they're not involved in the incident, yeah. there's someone that we could talk to about, you know, hey, how's he doing? Blah, 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 because they're in that different position. Well, yeah, and I'm notorious for getting to some of these scenes really quick. Um, you know, you and I are typically the first ones there. I don't know how we do it. <laughs> uh, and people always like, how do you get there so fast? But the first thing I look for is one of you guys. Yeah. You know, when one of our guys is involved in something, or one of our men and women are involved in something, I always look for you guys because I, before I even, I, I don't even need to know, I get enough of the story on the way there, uh, but their well-being is paramount to me. And I know if I don't see the bus there right away or, you know, uh, it's always a, a, a challenge anybody to find one where the first thing I didn't <coughs> really do was go and talk to the cops and make sure they're okay. Hey, you call your family. You know, they're going to see this. You know, little things like that. And But on the simpler side of it, it's, uh, you know, conversations that we typically have about, you know, uh, when I was an assistant sheriff and even as a chief, things would rise to my level that could be handled between, you know, a conversation sometimes. It, it, if it works between Dan and I or you and I, then why can't that work for a delegate in a briefing room and a captain? Sure. You know, so yeah. that the captain, again, go back to that sergeant, lieutenant, captain rank and giving them some, you know, ways to handle business appropriately and keep it consistent. But if it doesn't have to come all the way to us on command staff and executive staff, then so be it. You know, uh, that's what we want. Um, I don't think there's any downfall to that. Uh, Andy, there's a there's a couple things I wanted to talk to you about at the jail um, that could bring up morale. Um, I think they're little things like you know the uniform and the and the shaving policy being changed is going to increase morale. Um, one thing that's hugely um, popular at the jail, and our corrections officers think they're being treated differently than patrol, is the the mandated overtime. Right now, every officer is being mandated to work overtime. They're forced to sign up uh, for their days off. They're threatened with uh, discipline continuously by the lieutenants and captains over there if they don't. And we haven't mandated a single uh, police officer for overtime yet. Um, is there anything on your guys' So what, radar? remind me, we're doing two shifts a year, is that what? No, no, so it's, it's gonna be every four months. They'll have to okay. sign up for two or three shifts every four months um, okay. on their days off. Uh, but right now we have guys who are, who are calling me say, hey, I, I wanted to work the day as a day I normally worked. and. Yeah, I got canceled on it, but people were forced in, and so people are losing money. Some people are being forced in when they don't want to. Yeah. Um, no, it just seems to, like a mess. We have to take a look at that because I, I heard a story too recently where, uh, um, you know, the people that are working an inordinate amount of overtime, not picking a mandated day, for example, and then, you know, receiving a contact report or something yeah. for it. It's it's not designed for that, and it's not designed for, you know, the, it was – one of the motivations was, uh, you know, we had, uh, I think we were talking, you, you know, people working over 2,000, 2,500 hours of overtime. And, you know, for me, I, I worry about their well-being uh, long term. It's a lot of hours to work on top of, you know, regular work. Uh, but I just saw some numbers earlier this week that, you know, the top overtime hours uh, for the jail was down under 2,000. It was 1,800 and change, I think, which is a significant reduction in the number of hours the top overtime hour person worked. The dollar amount was was not the same person, but it just it's really about that. But we can take a look at it. Um, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to go back and look. It was the first time we actually did it, I think, in my, at least in my history where yep. we've done it so it, yes yeah, the, sk the scheduling of it so you know if it's not working or if it needs to be tweaked and adjusted then yeah that, i'll have a, <coughs> i'll make sure we take a look at that because it's not designed to be punitive in any way it's just designed to spread the wealth uh because one of the other complaints too which i, I know is h hard to believe but some folks told me they couldn't get overtime at the jail and i said how is that yep. even possible with all the overtime so 
we can take a look at that process though it's not it shouldn't be you know punitive in any way um it's designed to just spread the workload you know um for amongst the people that are working it but there's so much of it that i don't think the folks that want to work uh, um, i saw some of the same names on the list uh from this year to last year to the previous year so the folks that want to work the you know what i i mean they're just crazy amount of hours uh, they they don't seem to be lacking in any way for for the work, but uh, no, we could take a look at it. And one of the things I think that's going to help too is we've had some conversation. I haven't been updated in a while, but we've had some conversation with UMC about going back to a, you know a ward type of a, a yep. facility inside the the hospital, so that you know I don't have to have a guy handcuffed to a bed in, in a cardiac unit and then somebody else in ICU and then somebody out. else. And there's going to be some of those still, obviously, depending on the level of care they need. But there's, you know, we could go back to that model where we had a, if we can get the, you know, county to do that for us, that, that would be a big savings. And then uh, not only in overtime, but then in the demand of where we have to put people to work. So, uh, no, you have my word. I'll take a look at that. Thank you. Um, One other thing we have... Uh, we have a program, the Captain's Predisciplined Meeting, when everybody gets disciplined. It started three years ago. We've had great success with it. Um, on the patrol side, right now, I believe over 35% um, of those meetings where, where we met with the captain about discipline, discipline was reduced from those meetings. Um, and then we compiled the numbers from the correction side. And, and since the inception of the program, the captains on the correction side have not reduced one single uh, bit of discipline. I don't know if there's a disconnect. Um, I, I don't. I don't get it. The, the numbers don't lie, and it just seems yeah. like the the captains on the the correction side are are uh, treating our COs differently than the patrol <laughs> captains are. Yeah, I mean, the idea of those meetings is to listen to a, a, a you know perspective, obviously, that you didn't consider when you made your decision. So, you know, I think people in general have a hard time admitting they were wrong. Uh, I think that could be, you know, there could be something there with that. But, uh, you know, if there's 30% on the patrol side and zero on the jail side, then the number is pretty telling. Uh, you know, we, we have to make it clear that uh, if you want to change your mind, that's the only way you're ever going to change anything, you know, yep. start with yourself. So uh, they need to be fair in those processes. Now, I, I know you're not saying that they weren't fair, but, uh, you know, the, the goal of that meeting, obviously, is to consider a different perspective. And, uh, you know, we have to make sure that they understand that, you know, make a decision that you're happy with uh as a captain and as a leader uh make sure it's the right decision but uh you know uh don't make the decision you know worrying about how it's going to affect you personally make sure it's right for everybody because uh, i'm never gonna you know i'll ask people sometimes hey tell me how you made this decision i may not like it but we pay them to make that decision so yep. you know that's what they have to understand that sometimes it's okay to say yeah we could probably you know, do a little, do this one a little differently. And I know collectively too, where we've come up with solutions to some of these discipline issues, uh, you know, uh, that sometimes we're, we may not have agreed on the, on the outcome, but we've had a lot of conversations about discipline and, uh, you know, what's the appropriate thing. And we're not going to always agree, but, you know, it's okay to change your mind on something, especially when you're presented with new information or something that you didn't consider. Um, it's okay. You know, that's what those captains need to understand. If you want to reduce it, just, you know, just to keep the matrix in mind, obviously, we don't, we don't want to deviate too far or at all, but um, it's okay to say, yeah, we could do this one a little differently. Um, and I, I don't know. I've changed my mind plenty of times, so um, they have the same ability to do that. So what you're saying is it's okay to reduce it 35% of the time on that side, right? <laughs> well, look, obviously if it's being reduced 30% of the uh, uh, the time and, you know, I'll trust your numbers, but if that's what's happening on the patrol side, I, I you know, you could drive by headquarters. I'm not hanging any of those people upside down by their ankles. So it's obviously yeah. it's okay for the, to, for the, and, and that there's a reason we have it, right? It's, it is part of the process. And obviously the process is working on the patrol side. If people are saying, okay, fine, you know, let me reduce it. Uh, if, if it's, if it's not changing anything on the patrol side, on the on the correction side, then what we're in essence is saying is we got it right 100% of the time. Yep. Well, you know, it's police work. Uh, nothing's ever going to be right 100% of the time. So they have the ability. If there's if there's compelling, you know, information, which I'm sure in some of these cases there may have been, and obviously you wouldn't have brought it up. But if there's, you know, if the decision is being made simply because they think they want me to be happy, 
you know, I'll be happy that they make a decision, even if I don't agree with it. Um, yeah. If they said, no, I considered this and this is why I did it. And then that's how you learn. You know, you watch the outcome of those things when, you know, uh, you change your mind on things or you give people, uh, you know, you, you listen to their perspective and, you know, you, you see what you get from the workforce when you do those things. Little things like we already talked about, beards, pants, you know, 10-hour uh, shifts is another one. You know, places that aren't working for tens, you know, records and some other places on the police department that, you know, the sheriff's committed to a four, 10 hours, four work, four day, 10 hour work day schedule. Um, I, if I've, I've heard more about that than beards and pants and anything else that's really uh, created excitement in the workforce to, to want to, you know, to have those three days off every week. And um, those are the successes and that, that's a change, you know, yep. so they can change their minds. Uh, along those lines, I want to make very clear because this is not clear. I can tell you that from uh, some of the supervisors that are under you. When you say taking the department to four tens, uh, what you mean is, is the folks that work five right. days, then four. Yeah, five if you're days. on twelves, like CCDC, for example, we're not changing that because right. the, DTAC. What you guys you know, will probably learn is, is once you once Kevin said the twelve that everyone's going to go to tens. Yeah, the twelve hour. Folks, an email so. went out from <laughs> Metrocom because my wife works out there, and they said, "Up, oh, they're moving to tens, so our twelve hour shifts may be scrapped." And she, she asked me, "I said, no, that's not what the intent. The right. intent is and to same say, thing with the DTAC hey, guys. yeah, we want to give yeah. you an extra day off, right. three straight days every week, not two, three, two, yeah. three, like the county moved to. Right, and it's to benefit, not take away days from people." to make them have less days off. Right, and it even includes all the way up to people in my position, you know, our folks, uh, you know, but we're not gonna make any changes to the executive staff until we get the rest of the department situated, but, you know, and I gave them, I said, look, the, a, a natural way to do this is to have it coincide with the bump, but I wanna know what it's gonna look like long before the bump, you sure. know, uh, and make sure we have it all worked out with all the collective bargaining associations that are going to be impacted by it. But uh, no, it's the folks that are working 12s. I mean, the people in the jail that I've spoken to over the years, they love that four days yeah. off, you know, and um, I, I mean, that's an incredible amount of time to be away and take care of yourself and your family. But uh, those folks we're not going to touch. It's really to improve the quality of life of the people that have to work five days every other week. Um, it works at the city. It works at the county. It certainly can work for us. So one last thing before we uh, we cut this, out, and I know you probably committed way more time to this than we anticipated, right. but it, it usually ends up that way. Um, May 6th is our uh, our next police versus fire football game. Um, if you had to if you had to lay some odds on that, what, what do you think? Are, are we going to be wow. the favorite again? from what you saw last year. <laughs> um, and uh, anyone listening to this in the community, to get on board with helping us raise the money for the Law Enforcement Assistance Fund, the burn, uh, the PFFN burn unit, as well as the Children's Heart Foundation. Uh, but who wins? Do we well, come out I, on top I, of I don't think there's any question uh, after uh, last year's game uh, who's going to win I, I they couldn't have hired anybody in the last year that's going to help <laughs> overcome a, like what was it a 50 point uh shutout but uh uh no there's no question we're going to win the game it's but the goal would be not just how much do we win it by um but you know can we get the more people out there to the game can we raise more money can we get more support from the community for that and uh i don't want to take away from that event that's a big one but there's one coming up to uh, another charity event that's going to be held out in Henderson at the uh, Silver Knights Arena there on Green Valley yep. Parkway for Jamison Peacock and his family. I think uh, Justin Roth uh, and the hockey guys uh, here told me about it and asked if uh, the sheriff or I or both of us could uh, be out there for that night uh, to raise money for uh, Jamison's family. And, of course, we're going to be there. So that's another one that we need to – it's coming real quick. I think it was – the logistics of working out the date so not a lot of time to advertise it but for things like that that uh, you know uh, people are able to pull together to help uh, others uh, really is, signifies what this organization is all about and uh, you know young man losing his life the way he did to cancer and, and what you guys do with the, the football game last year was just great 
um, we have a lot of talented people here too, you know. Uh, and I'll put it out there now too. So the guys that were working in the jail, so they can hear it from me. I know last year there was a lot of consternation about practice time and all yeah. those things. Yeah, I want them to be able to go out there and practice and be a part of the team, and uh, we'll figure it out, uh, you know, when it comes to their schedules. Uh, but they have my my blessing to, you know, make sure that those guys are prepared for the game. So. Um, a total shelling last year, though. I mean, I don't, I'm surprised they actually want to come back. Um, I, I think they've committed to it, well, uh, but, uh, yeah, I think they think they have other players that just didn't play. Right. And I hope they do because, yeah, getting beat like a drum like they did last oof. year, it, it wasn't even oof. really fun to watch. I mean, I, I mean, was, I'm, I'm wouldn't be surprised if they're asking Henderson or North Las Vegas Fire or anybody. We, we, we opened it up to them. So the yeah. – the, Last year, they said, listen, we don't have as many people as you. Can we take from anywhere? I said, you can take from the entire state. I don't care. So you guys are at a different level than I was. When I was a captain downtown, we had uh, the Container Park wanted to have a – the first year I was there, they wanted to have a a taco eating contest between the police and the fire department. And I was really kind of worried, you know, uh, that – would we be able to compete because, you know, the firehouse is a place for good food, you know, and – I mean, and then had some guys like Mike Freeman and Jimmy Sutton and a few other guys, Kyle Hershey, who's, <laughs> you know, uh, retired now, but I had a few eaters. And so we went and it wasn't even close. I mean, yeah. they sent the CrossFit, you know, sure. keto yeah. guys and I sent those bears. And, you know, they, <laughs> I mean, I think they ran out of tacos before we actually declared victory. So then we did it a second year and we just abuse them again and I had all the trophies in my office if you're ever down at detail I hope those trophies are still there I hope Brandon Orr still has them somewhere by the third year it wasn't the fire department anymore they had had enough um, it was uh, they went and got all the security guards that worked in all the bars on Fremont and so we had a very large Pacific Islander crowd nice. that came to compete with uh, professionals my professional eaters yeah. and uh, I got a third trophy that year too so I you know you guys are doing charity football games and you know, hockey games, which is fantastic. The best I ever accomplished was a taco eating contest. But we you also, guys are a different we level. We also did the uh, pickleball. Yeah, we didn't. We weren't victorious yeah. in pickleball. Uh, Chad Lyman and I played a couple fire guys in a pickleball oh, charity game. Um, but what we do know is, I don't know what station number this is right by the PPA office, but every day, your firemen, whoever's listening to this, your firemen are out there setting up their own pickleball courts and playing pickleball with each other. So um, they're, they're hard at work. I know, didn't know what pickleball was until... Uh, during COVID when they said we're canceling all pickleball events and uh, it looks like a game actually I've seen some videos it looks like a game actually I might be good uh, at because there's limited mobility you know I, and I would I would older, like to knock it it's a game anybody can but do but damn was it fun yeah, it, it looks it, like ping pong but on the floor ping pong with a wiffle ball yeah and uh yeah it, and Chad's not good at this we we hung in there we never played it before Chad. we didn't know the rules Steve, Steve was a little better than Chad on it Really? You just got to get used to the ball. We never played it, but it was, uh, listen, I'm a natural athlete, so that's what I do. Can't teach speed. Yeah. Well, I don't have speed, uh, <laughs> but hand-eye coordination, I'm good I'm good enough at. Um, but no, we, uh, um, we think that we need to be doing more um, charity stuff, more, we, this, de- this department and their involvement in the community, we can do so much more, and along with the PPA and trying to get everybody on the same sheet of music and doing more things. Um, you know, there was a time uh we were at total odds with the department i mean i went out and purchased 15 billboards just to attack the department uh because of things that were going on and and sheriff lombardo and shit we didn't speak for two years him and i we'd walk in a room and walk opposite of each other um that's not a way for us to operate it doesn't make sense for us to operate yeah my members loved it hey suing them again hey suing them again it was funny but it didn't get things done and so you know i i hope these are and I'll, i'll be on record now uh as even uh contrary to what my folks up here have asked uh i'm out of here in less than four years now uh i will not be here in 2027 kevin's term and your term here is for four years i hope it's the easiest most um prosperous four years for all of us taking care of folks mental health mental well-being folks feel confident to talk with folks with the department with the wellness bureau about really getting help you know um i have a case and we can talk about that uh, a case later but it, it basically surrounds someone dealing with depression, substance abuse, and we're looking at disciplining this person and not asking where did we miss? And, and right. when I talk to you about the case, you'll be like, I just, this doesn't make any sense. Um, but it is what it is, but that was a different way. And I think you guys, I think we're going to see a lot of positives with, yeah. with you and Kevin, um, being engaged, working with the union, um, 
and and all of us trying to make sure all of our cops and uh, civilian staff too are, are enjoying this place because I do believe this. Uh, police work is a word of mouth business. If you've got employees bad mouthing the agency, their friends, their family, they're not coming here. They're going to go elsewhere. Right. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with the attacks on law enforcement. It could be the agency. Hey, things just aren't going well here. Go somewhere else. Go to Henderson. Go over to Northtown. I hope we get to a point, though, where we're going, no, this is, again, one of the best agencies to be on in, in the country. And uh, and we enjoy working in this place. And, you know, that gives Dan and I less headaches for right. the work we have to do. It gives you guys less headaches. Um, and, you know, I just don't know if – have you put in the budget for uh, – a a uh, ventilation system in your office for cigars. <laughs> Trying to convert the or, library. Or uh, even, I think that's a good move, you know, or even just adding a deck <laughs> off the back side to sit there. Because the truth is, and a lot of people don't really understand this, most of our work gets done, yeah. not in the labor management board, not in IA, not in a cert board. It gets done over dinner. It yeah. gets done over a cigar. And it gets done over friendly conversation to say, hey, let's, let's us talk right. about something here. Uh, and, you know, if we agree to disagree, that ha that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but but that type of stuff needs to happen for real business to move in any direction. Any executive anywhere will tell you things don't get done in the formal process. It's those behind-the-door conversations and the man-to-man, man-to-woman, whatever you want to call it. That's where a lot of work gets done. And so if we can have those open dialogues with one another and we actually genuinely – listen, I genuinely like you. I genuinely like Kevin. Uh, as crazy as it was, I genuinely like Joe, even at the end when people like Steve – your your personalities are polar opposites. Uh, it, it, you just developed a, a relationship with people, so those are important, and we hope to maintain those, um, even if we don't agree on right. things. Well, I think the key is always going to be listening, right? That's the. It's not so much what comes out of my mouth, but what goes in my ears that really is most important. And and, and the same is for everybody else. You know, we all have to, like you said, we're not always going to agree, but at least if I'm, if you know, you can call me and I'll listen. Um, and those, you know, we talk about the, you know different c ways to have conversations. I, I think, you know, the biggest successes that I've had is when people felt like they could tell me something, you know, whether it was at, you know, DTAC smoking cigars or whether they come into my office, you know, on a regular basis and ask for help with a promotional process or wh whatever it is that, you know, people bring uh, to the different leaders, not just myself on the police department. When we actually listen and then do something about people's concerns or at least give them an answer and say, no, we can't do that, at least they know we've listened. And but when then there's an opportunity in, the, in some of those when we do change our mind uh, for us to learn and grow. But when we say no to some things or we don't agree, explain a perspective, and then when both parties walk away feeling like they were heard, that's progress. That's success for me is uh, everybody understands that. Um, and it's never personal. You know, that's the thing that, that people – learn over time is that none of this is a thing it, it's everyone has something that they're responsible for and that they have to look out for but um y you know it's not personal but you have to listen you know you have to really listen to what people are asking uh and you know just going back to some of the things we talked about here it's really just simple about taking in a perspective and making a decision afterwards or not changing your mind or not changing your mind but at least giving people that time you know some uh, Sometimes it's just five or ten minutes for them to get something off their chest and tell you how they really feel about something, and then they feel better, and then they go back to work. I, I get the privilege of always, uh, you know, saying something along the lines of, you know, I work for the greatest police department in the world, or this is, you know, we talk about this being the finest police organization, and, you know, you're right. It's not just it, – it's we're made up of so many great men and women uh, that um, – really make this the fine this the reason i get to say that is because the people that come to work every day put that uniform on in one way or another or put a headset on or log into a computer somewhere uh, and do the work uh, that gets done here uh, to keep this community safe uh, whether you work in finance whether you work in dispatch whether you're out there pushing a black and white um, i get to say that because of those folks and when i stop listening to their concerns or their perspective on things then you know it's, it's never going to be about me. It's going to be about every one of those people that I serve uh, that works here and then the people outside the four walls of Metro that in the community, you know, that I serve. So listening is a b big thing. It's got to it's got to be heard. And then that's how we're really going to achieve greatness. And you're right. We have to always have dialogue. I, I, if we're not having that conversation to make things better, then then it's just going to be my way of doing things. And 
you know, that's not a recipe for total success. So the, the one the one thing I could leave you with is, is this. When you go out to an area command, uh, when you go out to a place like dispatch, wherever you go, and you, and you want to go talk to folks, uh, don't notify them. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Hey, Captain, I'm coming out to the briefing. So what happens? Yeah, you get a sanitized version. Sergeant yeah. tells them, don't ask anything, <laughs> don't say anything stupid. Listen, sometimes... What, I, what I've told everyone is is that you and Kevin are the guys that do genuinely want to hear it, and you're not going to be, be pissed off on what someone says. Now, I'm not talking about them being disrespectful and, and you know just assholes, but to say, hey, this is not working. This is failing. This is how we feel. This is how you guys do want to hear that. And But it will be watered down if you say, hey, by the way, we're coming. Uh, right. You know, you talk about dispatch. That happens every time you guys announce you're coming to dispatch. Managers are on the floor. Supervisors are calls are cleared up because they started help, and it's a it's a smoke show. It's not right. what really is going. Well, the on. good news is when I go to dispatch, they don't even know who I am. So, well, that's good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you got that going. So, um, we we do appreciate you, Andy uh, being here. Uh, I think it, you gave a lot of good insight to our folks. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, it's uh, and, and we still got a lot of work to do. We'd love to have you come back whenever you want Anytime. to. Anytime. Um, oh, uh, Police Week is one of you two going back. I believe the sheriff is good. Um, I think it's important that yeah. either you we'll or him representation there every year. Are we there. have the law enforcement appreciation day yep. Saturday of yep. the police Memorial park. There'll be uh, the sheriff will be there and other members of uh, executive staff will be there. Um, so yeah, well, you'll see representation from us good. at these big events. Uh, but if there's something to that, that's where, you know, an email to me or somebody reminding me of some of these things, if you haven't gotten a confirmation that there's going to be somebody there, uh, then just get a hold of me. And we'll make sure that we have representation there uh, to be amongst the cops. You know, sure. that's, that's nothing better for me than when I walk into a briefing room and see or stop by on a call and see people just working, having fun. Same fun we had when we did it. You know, it's, eh, uh, well. eh. <laughs> there's a few more laws in place and body camps, but yeah. uh, they still have some fun within reason. Yeah. Um, well, look, just <laughs> even a guy, you know, coming up to the sheriff on New Year's Eve saying, hey, they told me I wouldn't ask this, but I'm going to ask it. You know, that reminded me of, well, you and me, you know, like we, those are the things we would have done. You're not going to ask them, you know, like that kind of fun and that kind of banter, um, those things, it's just, it's pleasing for me when I see that there's still guys out there. Those are the guys that but, get it. They're having fun. At work. But what happens is, is that guy goes and tells the others that, Hey, they were actually pretty cool. Yeah. Like they, yeah. they were, we engaged. Right. And, and so that's a, that's a testament to who you guys are, that they feel comfortable. Even that one guy felt right. comfortable enough to say, no, no, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'll go talk to him. Yeah. And because it, it, you guys shouldn't be, and we feel this way too, uh, at the PPA and the e-board, you know, we're not out there doing the job. You guys aren't out there doing the job, but you shouldn't feel untouchable that nobody could speak right. to you, that nobody, oh. oh, they're here. They're in the building. Something's wrong. They're ripping me an IA. Something's wrong. And they right. have a weekend where they, you know, have internal issues in their stomach. But that shouldn't happen. You, we should we should all be, we're all just men. We're all just women. Right. And we have a position and people should respect that. But you shouldn't be someone that I can't even speak to. I right. can't send an email to. I can't. That's not the way the real world should be working. Right. You know, because that, that's when you build the bridge, the walls between you. Yeah. Communication stops when people think they can't have a conversation with yeah. you when they see you at a substation. Oh, I agree. I, I, look, I, I grew up in, you know, like I said, as a cop in New York, and people in my position there, so to speak, uh, were, were God, you never saw them. You know, they were pictures. And when you actually got to see them in person, if you ever did, it was, like, amazing. And that's why, you know, the sheriff has been out to substations already and to briefings and uh you know, we went to detox briefing on New Year's Eve after the briefing at headquarters. Uh, yeah, they have they have to see us and, and talk to us and, you know, kind of have those conversations with us to understand we're real people. You know, uh, yeah. we did the job. That, you know, you're right. There are things that are different today than they were 20-something years ago. But, uh, you know, uh, they still need to know that uh, all they want to know at the end of the day is, are you going to be there for me, right? Are you going to lead me? Are you going to be there for me? Uh, and when they see that and when they see the humanity involved in the people that, you know, I'm like when they get to talk with, speak with me or the sheriff or whatever, that, that they really want that, that that's nourishing to them. Uh, and that's not lost on me. This, this position, you know, it's, it sounds like something that, you know, oh, you know, yeah, sure. I'll be the undersheriff or I'll be a deputy chief or I'll be an assistant sheriff. You know, the, the stewardship and the amount of responsibility that comes with that, you know, um, and what it really means. It's like I said earlier, it means you represent 
the men and women that work here, uh, wherever you go, um, you represent the work that they do. Um, and when they're standing at those podiums or doing the you know, press conferences or speaking publicly in an event, um, they're there to represent those folks. Um, and they do a great job. They really do. We, we talked about our charity. Do you have a charity that's near and dear to you? Yeah, the Anybody Hundley Foundation. Get um, you know, I, I sit on the board of Opportunity Village. Uh, that's uh, really near and dear to my heart. Uh, that's been a great opportunity for me uh, to meet some families and people that without Opportunity Village uh, and the work that they do here in our community. Uh, but personally, uh, you know, my daughter, uh, Emma, uh, had uh, epilepsy and she you know, started with seizures. Uh, thankfully, she's gotten to the point where she's, uh, you know, off medication and they told her she would outgrow it. And, you know, the, the doctors in Los Angeles, the I give a plug to Dr. Deborah Holder in the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. Uh, but, you know, Janine was the one that actually found that place for us, and that's where we finally got answers. But, you know, watching your child have a seizure is a very traumatic event, uh, if not just for your child, it's for them. But, uh, you know, watching it as a parent, even uh, all the things I've ever experienced as a cop, I don't think there's anything that's, you know, troubled me more than watching that so we're grateful that we're past that but the Hundley Foundation uh, Brett Hundley who's an NFL quarterback uh, when he played for the Arizona Cardinals started a foundation because his own sister suffered from epilepsy and uh, Mike Morano who's one of our canine officers his wife uh, Danielle was uh, the president of that for a, a long time and she's stepped away to for a little bit now but uh, she got Janine and I involved in the Hundley Foundation and I know every year when they do their walk uh, I always ask the you guys to contribute and you always do and so yeah this year when that foundation when we do our walk again in sunset park uh, uh i'll put the arm on people to fundraise again but uh that's near and dear to my heart because i know uh you know uh when you that you when you look at the families that are impacted uh in our community by epilepsy and what it does to a person's life you know they can't get some jobs they can't drive they can't you know, as adults, it, you know, uh, conditions that are far worse than what Emma went through. Um, you know, it really is sad to see, but they make their way, right? They keep a positive attitude. And so just being there to support that foundation is something I'm going to do. Uh, we took the approach that uh, epilepsy didn't happen to us. We happened to epilepsy. And um, even though, like I said, Emma's condition, thankfully, knock on wood, is um, seems to be something in our rearview mirror could come back, you know, I guess. Um, but, you know, there are families that it's never going to go away, f you know, for them. Uh, so we're fortunate. But, you know, look, this position and the positions I've held over the years provide me an opportunity uh, to be you know, somebody that has, you know, a little bit of reach into the community. <coughs> um, so, yeah, the Hundley Foundation. Brett Hundley is a phenomenal human being and what he's been able to do. Uh, for us, uh, you know, UCLA kid played football for UCLA, but, uh, you know, uh, him and his team, uh, you know, coming into Southern Nevada and having an impact that they have. And their walk every year is a lot of fun. Um, but I kind of enjoy being the top fundraiser every year. There so, you go. Uh, but that's near and dear to me um, and my family. Uh, and but to families here in town, and the you know, amazing thing about it too is uh, over the years when, you know, we have people that work here who's, family or son ch daughter whatever going going through what we go through i'll get the random text or phone call hey this is so and so you don't know me but my kids having seizures what do i do you know and so it really has m made a big difference i think uh for for us to give back in that way and to contribute and to help and uh and sheriff when's their walk this year uh it's in they always do it in april okay. uh end of april beginning of may so but uh it's a tremendous event. You know, it gets bigger and bigger every year. They bring out uh, different healthcare providers and folks. It's it's really grown. But uh, I can get the date and share it with you all. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll um, you know, first of all, the Hun Hunley H U N L E Y H U N D L E Y Hunley Hunley okay Foundation, Hunley yeah. Foundation. Look it up on the internet. Uh, great group. Like uh, Sheriff said, we we contribute to it. Even though yeah. Sheriff's not a member of ours, his wife is. But that doesn't matter. Yeah. We just like to be involved in some of those things for. And Emma's for the team is uh, Emma's Crusaders. So uh, we had uh, there was a retired officer now, Christine Bodine. She was Christine Ostrowski. Or when we went through the academy, she was Christine Resco. But her daughter Taylor made up a sign. The first year we did the walk, she made up this banner on a board, and we have it on a pole and hangs in my garage from one year to the next. But it's a uh, 
it's a it's it's fantastic and we we've never gotten we've never changed from year one so emma's crusaders is the team and i'll push the link out when we do the yeah, well, fundraising for that if, but if you're not following our instagram page please follow our instagram page we do a lot of updates on there for uh, the general public as well as our facebook but we'll be pushing stuff out for that because uh, I, I do think it's important for us to support not just police organizations but anything in the in the community uh, we do stuff with the down syndrome group we rent out Opportunity Village and, and spend a lot of money there just because we know it's going to a good cause. Um, so it, it, we do like doing that stuff. So Hundley Foundation, if you uh, are interested, please look it up or contact us and we can get you in touch with uh, Sheriff Walsh about what you can do yeah, for Emma's Crusaders and the walk in April. Uh, Sheriff, we appreciate you being here way, way, way long. I've been getting the it's cut right. symbol for a long time. but uh, Make it you, two episodes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, always willing to come on and talk and answer the questions. Uh, promise the Adela make sure in in his uh you know the gift bag we put his Rolex in there uh, and, we, <laughs> and we put the cash um but uh yeah we uh we do appreciate you no, we know you're busy we know you it's week out. one but uh appreciate you being on here uh we'll come back with some uh some closing thoughts on uh on the show and uh, what we're going to do in the future all right so hopefully what I told you at the beginning about uh Andy and and the new staff being engaging you just saw it. Like uh, he wasn't afraid to answer questions. He talks like a normal, normal guy. You know, no, no pompousness about his position. And he's a, it's a highfalutin position, you know. And uh, I think he's gonna uh, stay as an engaging type of guy. Uh, one of the things that we get a lot of questions on because there's just not a lot of information on it was what we talked about with Andy. I mean, he didn't even I don't believe uh, truly understood the the drop program, and that's yeah. not his fault because it's a program that hasn't been around here. So. Dan, you've been working extensively on this uh, to yes. bring this program out. Maybe give people some explanation so that they understand what it is. So the DROP program is uh, you know, acronym for the Deferred Retirement Option Program. And they have uh, Deferred Re Retirement Option Programs in about half the states in the United States right now. And it's a great tool um, where uh, public entities and police departments can retain employees who have a lot of experience. So pretty much at the end of your career, when you meet normal retirement age, you can enter into the DROP program. And when you enter into the DROP program, you stop earning credits on your retirement. You technically retire on paper and your entire pension will go into the DROP account. Um, that DROP account will then, you know, the, the way we, we wrote it, um, it'll be uh, invested by PERS in their normal investments and you take the risk of the market. So if they lose money, you lose money. If they make money, you make money. Um, the the bill that we, we drafted, and it has to go to the legislator, and it has to be approved, so there's still time where they can uh, approve it or deny it or change it. But as it is right now, you have to commit to three years in the drop program. Um, so you enter, it's a minimum of three, maximum of eight. Uh, your entire retirement goes into that account. You start getting your colas at year three, just like normal. Um, your contribution of PERS will go to that drop program as well. The department's half that they pay will go to PERS, and that's what's going to make the, the program cost neutral um, to PERS to run it. Um, they get to keep that money, no strings attached. So you can't gain any more credit once you enter in. Um, but that money is going to be sitting there. It's going to be building and interest is going to accrue upon it. And you'll have a large sum at the end of the three to eight years on whatever you decide. But in the meantime, uh, the department will be able to keep employees a lot longer, um, three to eight years, hopefully. Uh, and they're going to be starting to fill and backfill those 300 um, positions that aren't filled right now. So it's, it, it will do a great job, I think, retaining and uh, making it more of an incentive to join, you know, police department in our state. And then you go, okay, well, which one do I want to join? Well, Metro's, yep. you know, the best one in the state, no offense to Northtown, Henderson, School Police, Washoe, RPPA, whatever. Uh, we're the best, we're the, we're the biggest. Um, the, the biggest thing is, um, and I, I read an article today um, in one of the newspapers on uh, Sheriff McMahill saying that um, going out of state hasn't really been successful, I believe, and, and he wants to gear it more towards um, candidates in the state and I believe one of the reasons why it isn't as successful is because we don't have a drop program if you're coming from out of state you want to leave your state and you have to look at their pension program if they're say hey we have these retirement dates we have a drop program it you're not gonna move out of state so that could be a tool that um, can bring that success up 
Um, I don't know all the answers, but when I moved here from Ohio in, uh, in 2007, one of the things I looked at was the pension, how it compared to the one in Ohio, the pay, the benefits, um, and it has to be competitive to get somebody to leave. Well, and as you as you brought this idea around, you know, I started bouncing it off of uh, some folks that were retiring, mm -hmm. and I said, "Hey, listen, if this program, after I explained it, was in place, would you leave?" And all of them said, "No, like that. That's a great idea. Like that's a great program." So I think the model is by word of mouth is proven that people would stay. I mean, that that's the point is to keep employees longer, to give you the backfilling, to catch up to the number you want to be. And you do that, unfortunately, with, you know, some greed. It's okay. You know, we, we don't do, people wouldn't do this job for $8 an hour. Just the amount of questions we've, we've gotten about the program shows that there's appetite for people and enrolling it. Um, it could solve, uh, you know, our, our on-field positions probably pretty quickly. Um, I'd say more than half the people retiring would enter it. And you have to have a, a, a financial gain to stay. Really, the, after you stay pa past your normal retirement age, it's a few thousand dollars more a year to stay. Um, but entering in this, there's a lot more money involved. However, when we say greed, there's really no uh, extra cost to the taxpayer. And, and there's a uh, savings, an inherent savings to the department because they're not paying that call out money um, anymore. So it's not like the department's out more money. They're either out the same if the, if the employee doesn't get call out or they're, they're saving money if there is call out. So in, in, in PERS, I believe, you know, we wrote it to be cost neutral, but the, the department's half of the contribution, I think, is going to be quite lucrative to PERS. And um, you know, I'm not 100% I'm not sure on it, but I'm 99% sure that there's going to be um, profit going to PERS from that and make the fund stronger. Sure. So that's a, that's a drop program in a nutshell. I want to turn to... Uh, Adela and uh, you know Adela handle you handle all our events and things like that what what's one of your pet peeves uh, from our membership that you know you just uh, want to kind of convey to them like hey do me a favor as we're doing these things don't do X um, my pet peeve is when I organize an event let's say you know be tickets hockey aviators it's the no call no shows Obviously, with the line of work that they have, we understand that people get called out, stuff happens, family sick, but at least call. Like, my phone number is on every single email that goes out. Um, call the office, just let us know. I literally have hundreds of people who want to attend an aviators game. Like, those are, that's really popular. And so, if Dan says you're going with six people of your family, I have those tickets reserved for you. But I also have probably 50 to 100 people wanting on my wait list. Yeah. So it, just please, just even if it's that same day, like I can find somebody to absolutely fill those spots. Um, it's probably the most irritating part when I check people in and I get four or five people that ate up maybe 30 tickets. That's, that's unacceptable. Just give me a call. I mean... I have trained most of the people, so they do. I had one kid who, poor kid, who had car trouble, I think, at an aviator gaming call. He took a picture, like, I really am sorry. <laughs> so most of them are really good, but please just call. Let me know. I, I, we have, I'm not going to be mad. It's not a big deal, but I just want to fill these tickets. I mean, it is something that, you know, it's in my budget, and it's a cost. So we want to make sure as many people go. And we just finished up the year. We had some awesome events. Um, Santa Day was great. What can we look forward to in 2023? So more, more of the same, or more, more, of the more, <laughs> more of the same, and whatever else this man decides to come up with. Um, we have Easter coming up. Um, that's probably our next big one that we have. Yep. Um, so that that's always good. That's here at the PPA. We have the Easter Bunny come out. We have pictures and Easter egg hunt and food. Uh, so th those ones are good. Uh, after that, what do we have? Well, last year we had food trucks for the first time up here, and I we thought did. that was awesome, and mm -hmm. a lot of members liked that. Um, so good thinking on that. Uh, my favorite was the, um, what was it, the, the ice cream thing. That was great. 
the it was uh, the Hawaiian shaved oh, ice cream. More yeah, like yeah, a, yeah, yeah. More like an ice cream. Oh, the Dole Whip Dole, guy. Yeah, yeah, Dole Whip. Yeah, yep. John, ate, to... John ate half of mine. Yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> that's <laughs> like came... every day for Adela with lunch. John <laughs> Abel eats half of her food. She doesn't get to eat her food, and he goes, "Hey, how much do you have for me?" So he poaches everybody else's <laughs> that's food. Pretty much true. Uh, that was at our game, wasn't it? Our football. We game. had them at the game, the game. and mm-hmm. also I think we had them at summer bash. summer yeah. summer bash. Yeah. Um. So. All right, we talked about all that. Um, we talked about, oh, you know what, Dan? Uh, so recently, and this is for our local followers that are, are in state, um, we talked about LEAF, which yep. is what we play the football game for. Uh, a company sent out a flyer on behalf of us uh, to about 10,000 residents yep. in the state uh, about so, uh, fundraising for LEAF. Um, it was a legitimate campaign. We are contracted with them. They are doing work for us for that. Uh, but... How could someone, Dan, if I lived in Florida and uh, I follow the podcast or whatever, uh, how could I, could I make a reincurring donation yep. to, to yep. LEAF and how could I, if I'm not in the state? So just, uh, just so everybody knows, it's uh, the Law Enforcement Assistance Fund. And uh, primarily that fund is used as a um, uh, widows and orphans fund like back east um, to take care of uh, the officers and their families I'm sorry, the officers killed in the line of duty and their families, so the, the surviving families. So once one of our officers is killed in the line of duty, we'll, we'll reach out and uh, we'll give them birthday presents, Christmas presents, and we'll pay for their um, college at an in-state tuition rate. Um, and if you want to donate to that, um, there's several ways. I mean, just uh, the easiest way, um, mail it to us at 9330 um, uh, Westlake Mead, or you can go on to leaf ch- leafcharities.org. And we'll uh, we'll post a link to that, um, and you can go and donate with your credit card. You can set up through reoccurring through your bank account, however you um, it's more convenient for you. But yeah, we just finished up our first mailer ever for Leaf, and um, there was a lot of uh, you know curiosity if it was going to be successful or not because there's a cost involved in that. Um, but it was end up being successful. Um, we had uh, one person who generally donate uh, ten thousand dollars from the community, so it shows that um, our community supports us. Uh, people want to help; they just didn't know about it. And uh, we plan on doing another mailer uh, for the spring, and we'll continue to do mailers in the fall as well. And yeah, so, if you see something for for Leaf, uh, odds are it is legitimate. Uh, not like some of those phone calls you'll get from the police union of yeah. las we, vegas we won't we're we not won't calling any anybody calls. um if you get any of that stuff those are either somebody scamming or it's uh, someone's got their own little angle uh, but if you genuinely have a question you can call up to us and ask us hey this is what i got is this legitimate um but uh, but yeah so if you're interested you know like dan said you can go to our our charity page and make donations um or you could just reach out to us personally and and do something but uh, we do appreciate the help it is the it is the only fund that I believe that actually directly impacts and is built for the fallen and their families. And uh, that's what we've been committed to since our charity came about, as well as college scholarships for some of our kids that are uh, donors to LEAF as well. Um, and it's been a successful program. Dan has really spearheaded it and made it something that has been uh, uh, extremely good as far as the fundraising angle and what we do and how we do it. So. Um, if you're interested, please reach out. Uh, I'll close with uh, a, a final thought that I had uh, from the other day on uh, Monday. Uh, we saw the uh, the poor young man with the uh, Buffalo Bills that had a heart attack on the field um, after making a, a big hit. And uh, it, it kind of brought to mind the, the, the safety that a lot of people go through and the potential perils a lot of people go through in different aspects of employment whether playing a professional sport, whether being a police officer, a soldier, um, fireman, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, but it puts into perspective that you should never take for granted anybody and anything they do. Um, uh, you take that poor kid that was just suiting up to play a game, and all of a sudden, you know, he's fighting for his life. Uh, you take a police officer uh, like Ty, uh, who was out working, trying to help the, the community, and loses his life. Um, so, you know, Somebody said it on one of the shows, you know, before you pass judgment on the uh, people out there and their professions, sports, police work, nurses, airline pilots, it doesn't matter. Um, realize that everybody has a, a, a potential for not coming home. Sir, some are greater than others, police, military, but 
uh, in all, uh, before we chastise folks, you, you should kind of think about what they go through and what they put yep. themselves through. And, and even those, that poor kid, you know, he's putting mo- money in his bank account, food on the table for his family, but he's out entertaining people. I mean, people are watching NFL football on Monday night and they're being entertained by this poor kid uh, who then, you know, almost had his life taken from him and is still fighting. Um, but uh, one thing I'll say that was really neat is how the community rallied around his charity, which was getting presents to kids. And I think his GoFundMe is like over 5 million. Seven, 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 is it really? Two, no. You know, I mean, that that's that's what that's what matters the most. You know, that poor kid uh, went through what he's going through in his family. But, uh, you know, again, it's all professions all across the gamut, all across the map. So, um, you know, just kind of be thankful for what you have. Maybe not pass judgment on others for what they do or what they have. Um, whether they make ten million dollars a year or a police officer who makes you know fifty thousand dollars a year that works in Midwest somewhere, um, that everybody's important and, and safety has its issues for a lot of a lot of things. So um, we look forward to bringing another uh, show to you guys pretty soon. Uh, we're going to get this up and running as quick as we can. Uh, we always want to thank uh, Roland Seven for doing our production. Uh, if you ever need anything, that's a good group to reach out to. And I'd like to thank Adela for being the producer and taking this whole thing. <laughs> and, of, of course, uh, Sheriff Walsh for coming out. And he volunteered to come out weekly, I think. Yeah. I yeah. heard after the show. So Yeah. When, when he, he heard about our 2.8 million viewers, um, it, it was uh, it really kind of rang true to him. He's like, hey, this is a, a audience I need to be in front of. So to you, 2.8. What is that? Two point eight four five million that we have now as it continues to roll. Um, I would like uh, JD, and you can just answer with a head nod or Adela. I'd like to do a live one. Like I, I'd like to do something where we could go Facebook Live with our podcast, have live phone calls, tell our members, "Hey, we're doing a live one with Sheriff uh, McMayhill or whomever." Like you want to call in or send us an email, like, "Hey, ask this." I think that'd be kind of cool. Like yeah, not not cool. just recorded and sent out, but Let's get some live feedback. Whoever wants to call in, it could be a community group that calls in with a question. Doesn't matter. But I think it'd be kind of a neat change to what we do. So if we could, he, he's, I got while, the thumbs up. While David's gone, let's get the approval. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, we'd have to really, you know, kind of filter uh, what comes in um, and, and watch ourselves. But I think it would be a neat uh, just a Q and A with our membership or the community. Hey, call in. We're live mm-hmm. and uh, ask your questions. So. Uh, and then we'll, of course, have the lovely Robin Quivers here, uh, making sure we get everything rolling. I, I would also like to start a segment where we talked a lot, and uh, Walsh also talked a lot about it, the wellness of our police officers. I think we need to start looking at the families of these police officers. I mean, I'm a police officer wife, and there's a lot that kind of goes with that. So I would like to kind of dive into that a little bit and maybe... I don't know, have wives on. I will have to kind of think of what I would like to do, but I think we need to address that. I mean, our families go through a lot. The wives go through a lot. The kids at different stages of their, you know, they have to answer to a lot. So I think we need to also address that, um, not only the wellness of the officer, but the wellness of the family itself. So we need to we need to do that. Listen, if, if you know the content creator of our show... <laughs> You should be able to say, "Hey, this is what we're doing today, guys." So, uh, you, you've got uh, you've got the ability to run the gamut on what we're doing here. So, uh, yeah, I think some. And if anyone's listening to this and you have some ideas for something we could do, uh, heck, if you know a celebrity that would like to be on here, somebody that we could reach out to and say, "Yeah, that'd be kind of cool to get their perspective on law enforcement and the the communities and things going across the country," uh, let us know. So um, we could always uh, get some good information and good content, just kind of guide us. So. Uh, with that, on behalf of Dan, uh, Adela, Sheriff Walsh, uh, myself, we really appreciate your membership. We appreciate you yep. taking the time to be engaged with our show. Uh, again, follow us on Instagram. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, I did put out an email before the new year that if we got above 5,000 followers on Instagram, uh, that we would raffle off a $250 gift card to our members. Um, and we could even think of something to do with people that just follow our page. So if you could go follow our page, like our Facebook page, and uh, we'd appreciate it. So look forward to talking to you on episode 14. This is episode 13, and we'll see you on the next one. And we're out. Discretion is advised.